So good. Why don't you go ahead and take your Bibles and open to the book of Genesis, chapter 17. Genesis 17, as we continue walking through the book of Genesis, uh, the title of the message is Our Covenant God. And the word covenant is something that resonates with me. And if you've been coming here for any amount of time, I hope that it resonates with you as well. I I love to belong to the Evangelical Covenant Church. Uh, You know, not because it's a great denomination filled with awesome people, though it is, but mostly because uh, I I like when people ask me who I work for. And and I start off by saying, well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. And of course, they don't believe me, so they always want me to tell them. And I, then I say it like this. I'm like, well, I'm a member of the, uh, the covenant. It sounds like a secret society, doesn't it? We always refer to it as the covenant. And uh, so the covenant uh, is a great word. It's a good biblical word. Uh, and I think that we ought to develop like a handshake, a special handshake for it. I, I remember when I first started uh, pastoring Evergreen some time ago now, uh, I was called by the local funeral director and he asked me if I could do a funeral for a woman who had been living in Indiana but was actually from this area. And I said, sure. He says, oh, good. He says, there's just one thing I, I got to let you know. And he's like, I'm not sure if this is significant or not, but she's a member of the Freemasons. And so there's going to be a lot of Freemasons. And I don't really know what the Freemasons are. I was actually impressed because there's a woman that belonged to her. I always thought it was like a boys club, you know. I'm like, well, that's fine by me. I'm not going to do anything differently. So it was a graveside funeral right down the street at Evergreen Cemetery. And what stood out to me is that this one man came and shook my hand. And it was just weird. Like, it was a strange handshake. Like, it just felt off. And after the funeral and everything's done, I kind of remembered something about a special handshake among the Freemasons. So I looked it up. And sure enough, they have special handshakes. And I don't know if he was giving me a special handshake or if he just shakes. But I wondered, I thought, I bet because I was officiating the funeral, like, and it was for a Freemason, I wonder he was checking to see, like, are you a Freemason? And of course I'm not. So obviously I gave myself away by whatever handshake I did, uh, which was probably equally awkward. Uh, But, you know, so we're in the covenant. You're in the covenant now. And uh, we're going to have to come up with a special handshake for each other. You know, not every church that has the word covenant in their name is part of the Evangelical Covenant, part of the ECC. Uh, For instance, in Baldwin, uh, there is a church, a wonderful church, and it is called Covenant Community Methodist Church. But it is not a covenant church, as in the ECC. They're a Methodist church. And uh, so they've got the word covenant in their name. And the reason why is because covenant is a very popular biblical name. Uh, And it has a deep meaning to it. And so a lot of people are going to be drawn to this particular name. And in fact, we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, but actually more accurately, it should be called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And we are members now of the New Covenant that was established through Jesus Christ. So a good question to ask is, so what is a covenant? And the Bible Project, I highly recommend it. They do some great educational videos for the Bible. And they had a really nice, uh, precise and short definition of covenant. And it's, they say this, a covenant is a chosen relationship or partnership in which two parties make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths, signs, and ceremonies. Covenants contain defined obligations and commitments, but differ from a contract in that they are relational and personal. And that's the key between a covenant and a contract. A covenant is relational and personal. Like a marriage. A marriage is really a modern day example of what a covenant is. Where two people choose to form and enter into a formal relationship with one another. To be faithful and devoted to one another. uh, To do life together. To create a life together. um, That might also include encouraging one another. Whether it's on a career path or whatever path that the person is growing and developing in. uh, Sometimes it includes raising children together. And it is a covenant. That's covenant because it's relational and it's personal. A contract is different. A contract isn't necessarily relational. It's more just legal. And I learned this the hard way when we had bought our first house and we had to get a mortgage and I had to have flood insurance 
on our house because we have a small creek that flows through the backyard. It's actually a controlled overflow channel. So I don't know why, even when there was major flooding in Grand Rapids, our house was fine. Other people's house, not in the flood zone, not so fine. Nonetheless, I had to have flood insurance. In the contract or the mortgage lease, it said that, my, that we had to have flood insurance according to FEMA's regulations, which is you have to cover the amount that you still owe on the mortgage. So my mortgage kept getting sold to someone. I don't know why they sell these. They must make money off them somehow. Everything's supposed to stay the same though, according to the contract. So it finally gets sold to Bank of America. Sorry if you work for Bank of America, I have hard feelings. <laughs> and uh, we get a call and they say, you don't have enough flood insurance on your house. I said, sure we do. We, cover the amount that's in the mortgage and we've got, I've got, no, 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 you need to cover the value of the house. And I said, no, no, in the contract it actually says, so we're going back and forth for a week. Finally, she calls me up one day and she says, you see at the end of that sentence where it says, or other circumstances? <laughs> this is what she said. That means we can do whatever we want. Sure enough. You know, when I was reading that, I didn't even notice or other circumstances. Like, and when I reread it, like I thought, well, like extenuating circumstances, like beyond our control. But no, she's right. Or other circumstances mean everything I just said or whatever I feel like doing. And so we were stuck because there was no relationship. You know what I mean? It's just a contract. Legally right, legally wrong, whatever I can get away with, it's a contract. Covenants are not merely legal, they are relational. The expectations uh, can change actually in a covenant based on healthy relationship. There can be give and take, there can be changes that are made. Because it's a relationship, you don't just care about the legalities of it. You aren't looking for typos or loopholes. I had a friend who owned a business and he wanted to expand his business, so he had a shop where that's where his main business was, and he wanted to do some outlets in some other shops that did similar things, but not the same things. And so what he did is he rented to lease some space in someone else's store, and in that store he would have an employee that had a section, and she or he would sell items within that store, but for his store, and it was kind of a way of branching out. And so he signed a two-year lease with someone that he somewhat had a relationship with, and after about six months, he realized this ain't going so well. Like we're not selling anything and I'm actually losing money because I'm paying a salary, but I'm not getting income that even covers it. And so he called up the guy and he said, hey, I'm wondering if I can buy out, you know, buy out this contract. So I'd like to end it early and I'll give you money toward it or a few months, you know, rent, even though I'm not going to be there. And the guy said, nope. It's a two-year contract. It's a two-year lease. So he explained what was going on, and he assumed that because there's some sort of a relationship, like he'd understand, and he was still going to make it worth his while, but the guy, nope, can't do that. So he hired a lawyer, and the lawyer couldn't find anything in the contract that would let him out of it, except that he kept looking at it, and he saw a clause in there that was meant to protect the guy who was doing the lease. And it said, and if the leasee does not pay rent for two consecutive months, this contract will be considered null and void. <laughs> so he calls up, he says, hey, um, so I'm not going to be paying your rent for the next two months. <laughs> and the guy said, what do you mean you're not going to be paying your rent? He says, well, the contract's going to be null and void if I don't pay you rent for two months. <laughs> the guy goes, okay, let's go back to the buyout. <laughs> That's contract, Right? Uh, and covenant is not contract. Covenant is relationship. Covenant, the first covenant, was made by Noah, between God and Noah. And the sign of the covenant was a rainbow in the sky. Now, the second covenant is right here in our passage today. We're going to go ahead and start with uh, chapter 17, and we're going to begin with verses 1 through 8. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant be between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. 
I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. The word of the Lord. So the first thing I want us to notice is that covenants change us. Covenants change us. Because covenants are relational, they are also transformational. Now, mere rules and regulations don't change us. And I shared when I was working for Teen Challenge in Minneapolis, sometimes we'd have to write up someone for a disciplinary action. And at the top of that sheet that we would write up for disciplinary action, it said, rules without relationship equals rebellion. It was in bold. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. In other words, like if all this is for you is rules, like you're just expecting these students to follow rules, but you don't have a relationship with them, understand it's going to get worse. Transformation happens through relationship. So you might have to discipline them, but make sure that you sit down, you have a conversation, you understand each other, and they understand the nature of what's going on and how the discipline fits with their actions. We were looking for transformation and rules without relationship equals rebellion. So Paul tells us as much when he describes the limitations of the law. The law can't change us. It can't transform us. So salvation through Jesus Christ is first and foremost relational. We are so familiar with the story of Abraham and this covenant that we might not realize that something radically new is happening in human history right here in this passage. John Walton, the Old Testament theologian, explains, he says, There are no parallels in the ancient world to covenants between deity and mortal. Though certainly gods are known to make demands and promise favorable treatment, In most of these cases, kings report their care of the sanctuaries of the God and then tell how the deity responded with blessing. But these fall far short of a covenant relationship initiated by a deity for his own purposes. There is no record in human history of all the false gods that were worshipped of a God ever making a covenant with a human being. That would have been beneath them. Covenants were always between people, genuinely fairly equals. But our God... El Shaddai, God Almighty, who will be known as Yahweh, enters into a covenant with a human and his descendants, which shows you how much he thinks of humanity. The priority of covenant is relationship. We tend to be drawn to the land of promise, right? Well, there's a promise of land. It's actually very secondary, even though in evangelicalism today, we're all about Israel and the promise of the land. That's in there, but it's definitely not the main focus. The main focus is repeated in our passage, which is one of the ways you know it's the main focus. In verse 7, the promise is that I will be your God and the God of the descendants after you. It's repeated again in verse 8, the second part, and I will be their God. Now, remember, Abraham is from Ur, the land of the Chaldeans, which is ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iran and Iraq, ancient Babylon. He came from a people who believed and worshipped multiple gods. In fact, everyone on the earth worshipped multiple gods. To worship one god was something very new indeed. You see, they never imagined that one God could actually be big enough to be able to have influence over all things. So they worshiped many gods, and the gods, they would oversee different spheres of life. So one God would oversee rain and crops in a certain area and region. And then another God would oversee fertility for animals and humans alike. And then there would be another God who would oversee the outcomes of wars, and another God who oversaw the binding of contracts and covenants between people. But something happens in Genesis chapter 17. Abraham and Israel worship El Shaddai, God Almighty, one God who can be over all things. And they're to worship him exclusively. We have no reason to believe that they don't believe in the other gods. But what they are coming to agree to is that they will worship one God, and him alone, and he will oversee all aspects of their life. They don't need the other gods for those other purposes. So they're committing to an exclusive relationship 
with the one true God, a relationship between this God and Abraham and his descendants. And they're not to worship the other gods who will become known as false gods because worship of the false gods is connected with immorality. The false gods are a lot like fallen humans. My grandmother used to tell me, be careful who you keep company with because you'll become like your friends. (laughs) Be careful. The pagan gods reflect fallen humanity, broken humanity. They're constantly lying and cheating and taking advantage of one another. The gods reflect a dog-eat-dog world. Humans sought the gods mainly for personal advancement. It wasn't relational, it was transactional. And the gods needed humans because the gods needed the sacrifices to sustain them. They needed the worship and the honor in order to have clout among the other gods. But Yahweh establishes a sacrificial system. And though it's like the sacrificial systems of the worlds around them, and Israel does have sacrifices, he he ultimately tells them that he doesn't need these sacrifices. I think that God established a sacrificial system is because the Israelites and the world that they were in, that's how they understood how to relate with God. And God meets us where we're at, but he doesn't leave us there. So he tells them in Psalm 59 to 13, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. Just even hear that, it's relational. If I were hungry, I would not tell you For the world is mine, and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? This is new in the ancient world, because they believe that the sacrifices did somehow sustain the gods, that they needed the sacrifices. It was their food. They needed the blood offerings. It was their drink. God's telling them, you do these sacrifices, and he will point it to something else significant. He'll use it. So we might understand what Christ Jesus is going to do for us. But God doesn't need them. The ancients believed that the gods did. But Yahweh makes it clear that he wants nothing but relationship. He seeks the good of those who are in relationship with him. And it's relationship itself that he desires. And sin can really be understood and defined as anything that hurts relationship. This is why Jesus said, There's really only two laws you need to follow. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do these two things, you will fulfill all the requirements of the law. If you live in love toward God and one another, sin won't even factor into it. Then there's the land, but this is the secondary clause, and it comes with conditions. Verse 8, the first part says, The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give it as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. So the land is promised to Abraham and to his descendants, that is Israel, but it is conditional. It's based on a right relationship with God. And I think people forget that. They're always like, well, God promised Israel the land, so it doesn't matter who they have to shove out of the way to get it. Actually, if you look at Leviticus 26, it's actually very clear under what conditions Israel is allowed to land. And one of those conditions is how they treat the foreigner among them. The land is always considered land use in the Bible because it always actually belongs to God. He is the vineyard owner. The land is the vineyard and Israel are the tenants or the vineyard laborers. Israel retains the rights to the land based on their right relationship with God. And it's remarkable how clearly right living is tied to right relationship for the Israelites. When Israel is not in right relationship with God, it shows morally. When they are in right relationship with God, it also shows morally. I've been going through the Psalms, and as I read it, and I've been trying to learn Hebrew this way, I'm amazed at how many times the word for righteousness and for law and for covenant are, are mentioned in the Psalms. And it's always, I have adhered to, I follow, I long for this way of life. 
And when you compare the ancient Israelites with any of the other ancient cultures, it is amazing how morally and how much moral integrity they have compared to the world around them. They were advanced when it came to morals. They truly tried to live a good and decent life with God, with each other, and with the world around them. They were set apart from all the other people in the world in this way. And righteousness, it's the same, the word for righteousness in Hebrew is the same word for justice. And it means this, to do right by another. So to live righteously is to do right, to live in a way where you're doing right by those who are around you. How we live in love and honor each other is how we live righteously. Right relationship is essential to God. And that's what we mean when we say that he's a covenant God, that relationship is everything to him. Covenant focuses on how we relate to each other as well. So it's covenant and it's relationship that changes us and transforms us. And this is represented by Abram and Sarai's name change. When does their name change? When they enter into an official covenant relationship with God. And names have meanings in the ancient world. And John Walton says this about Abram's name. He says, the name Abram meant the father is exalted. Reference to father, Ab or Av in Hebrew, in personal names usually indicates veneration of an ancestor. So this name looked to the past. His new name designates Abraham as the significant ancestor as it looks to future generations yet to be born. So Abram looks to the past. It's the veneration of a past father. But Abraham looks to the future promise. He's going to be the significant father, the father of many nations. And in that way, it looks to the future. And that's significant, and we'll get to it in just a moment. Scott Duvall talks about uh, Sarai's name. She's, he says, but Sarai and Sarah mean princess. But the former is, now, is how the word is pronounced in Mesopotamia, and the latter, how it is pronounced in the promised land. Perhaps the name change is related to the move from Mesopotamia to their new home in Canaan. I love this theory. So Sarah and Sarai both mean princess, but how it's pronounced in Mesopotamia is Sarai. And God is saying, no, this is your home now. Your name is Sarah here. And again, it looks toward the future and her destiny as being the mother of many nations. Either way, if you have a friend named Sarah, I encourage you to now just refer to her as princess. Okay? I'm sure she'll appreciate that. <laughs> good. Or maybe not so good all the time, right? Well, we named Basil and his name means king. We should have thought twice about that. <laughs> Uh, relationship with God changes us. When you name someone or something in the ancient world, typically it means that you have authority over that someone or something. A person's name is also believed to be intertwined with their identity and their destiny. And therefore, if you name a person, it means that you're having something to do with controlling their identity and their destiny. In this case, naming Abram, Abraham, God changes Abram's destiny. He will be the father of many nations. He changes his future. And destiny has to do with direction. So we talked about our God. Covenants change us. And the second point and the final point is that covenants direct us. Let's go ahead and continue reading Genesis 17, 9 to 11. It says, Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant that you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. We're not talking about rainbows anymore. <laughs> so God takes complete responsibility for the first part of the covenant. He will bring about the many descendants for Abraham. He does that. We talked about that a couple weeks ago when he walked through those animals that had been cut in half. But the promised land comes with conditions. Verse 9, Abraham and his descendants must keep covenant. That means keep 
right relationship with God. God gives a sign of a covenant as a constant reminder, and that sign is circumcision. Circumcision was not unique to Abraham and Israel. It was practiced among the Egyptians, where Abraham had spent some time, and also among the Canaanites, which is the promised land. And so he's familiar with it. It appears to have been a rite of passage for most cultures, used differently and at different times. But it was used like when a boy would turn 12 or 13, and he would now be part of the tribe officially. Or for some cultures, they used it in marriage. When you were getting married and you were creating your own tribe now, your own family unit, and you would get circumcised. So here in our text, it signifies relationship with El Shaddai, God Almighty, Yahweh. They're coming into relationship with God, and this will be the sign. And it's appropriate that it's circumcision because it's tied to what? The seed, the descendants. And if you don't know how to make that connection, then ask your mom or your dad. All right, so what I have here, I see these guys giggling over there. This is funny, isn't it? Like, this is the ancient form of social media. And someone's mom decided that they wanted to capture this day, you know, for for all ages to see. So this is actually a carving of a circumcision ceremony. It's all right to laugh. That's funny because some kid had to have this carved in his neighborhood because his mom's like, oh, I'm so proud of you, Johnny. And little Johnny, can you imagine little Johnny walking to school and be like, Johnny, that kind of looks like you. He's like, no, it's not me. <laughs> I'm really glad that they, <laughs> when I was a teenager, they didn't have Facebook or, or anything that could capture these moments. And my mom didn't think the carving those special events on the wall. For thousands of years, this has been on a wall of some guy's ceremony of circumcision. So anyway, just to keep things interesting. <laughs> So in time, God would give continued direction to what it means to live in covenant with him and to be a covenant people, what it looks like to go forward as his people. And they would grow in their understanding, just like we grow in our understanding of what it means to follow Christ. So it just begins here. One God, you worship. That's all Abraham has to do. And this sign of being in relationship with me. In time, there will be more things that come, what it means to be able to walk in relationship with God. It's really not unlike the new covenant with Jesus. I remember there was a point in my life where I made a simple acknowledgement that I was a sinner, I was broken, I was wanting, and that I needed a savior. And that's how my relationship with God began. It was really that simple. But in time, I grew in my understanding of what it means to follow Christ. I'm still growing in my understanding of what it means to follow Christ. So we begin with a simple confession and realization, but we continue by becoming more Christ-like. Transformation that happens through relationship because covenant is about relationship, a transforming relationship. And it is relationship that gives us direction. I like to call it Christward. We're moving Christward. So I leave you with this final question. How does your covenant relationship with God direct your life? How does your covenant relationship with God direct your life? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. You are our God, our El Shaddai. You are the Almighty. And you rule over all things. And our desire is to let you rule over all things in our life because we know that everything you do you do for us, for our benefit. And we're thankful that though you don't need anything from us, you want to be in relationship with us, that you love us for ourselves. And while sometimes that baffles us, we're ever grateful. We thank you for the work that you're doing in us. We thank you for the work that you sometimes are able to do through us when we make ourselves pliable and obediently follow. And For each one here, including myself, Lord, may we reflect this week on how our relationship with you is directing our lives. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and give us a will to follow. We know that through your Holy Spirit, you are able to do all things, even change us, even cause us to be able to hear your voice 
and to follow in your way. So for each one that is in a process of discernment, or for those of us who haven't been discerning at all, may we begin to see the signs of where you want to move us, how you want to transform us, and may we work with you as you work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.